One of the biggest news stories in the UK at the moment related to trees is about ash dieback, a disease which has only recently been found in Great Britain, but that has been spreading across Europe since the early 90s. It seems to have begun somewhere in Eastern Europe, and there's been a wave traveling across that has just about reached the UK now. It seems to be a, a newly evolved disease, or at least it's a new variant of an old disease. And as it passed through Northern Europe, it's killed probably 75% of mature ash trees. There's a lot of talk at the moment about control measures, about restricting the import of ash from the continent and whether we can stop it reaching the UK. The unfortunate truth is because this is probably dispersed by birds and insects and maybe also by the wind, it's likely to be a matter of time. It's been found in multiple locations in the UK and within a few years I would expect ash dieback is going to move through the ash population across the UK. It should be a little stricter instead of calling it ash dieback because there's a number of things which are called ash dieback. This is Calara dieback. It's named after Calara fraxinea which is a fungal pathogen. What the Forestry Commission are asking for at the moment is for people to spot the symptoms of ash dieback and report it so it's useful to know the types of things to expect to see. What you might see is the tips of these leaflets turning brown and spreading down along the central um, axis of the leaf along here. And so you'll see the, the leaves gradually dying back as the name suggests. And sometimes you actually get more of a necrosis that's actually growing down the actual, uh, the actual leaf itself, down the medulla, into the petiole of the leaf. In older trees, when it affects them, the edges of the crown die back, so you have dead twigs sticking out of the top often with some bushiness as the tree tries to recover deeper in, but then gradually the tree will die back down throughout its crown. One of the worst things about this disease is that unlike, say, Dutch elm disease, which primarily affected large stems, ash dieback seems to be really affecting the young ash trees, the regenerating stems. So the older trees will probably live for a few more years, they might suffer from a few phases of it, but the young trees get wiped out quite quickly. It's a fungus, so it's spores of a fungus that are spread around. And actually, once the tree has started to succumb and dead wood is falling, you can see tiny mushroom-like fruiting bodies on the twigs that land on the ground. Ash trees are one of the most important trees in the UK. They're the third most abundant tree after oaks and after birches. And it is fair to say that this disease, if and when it spreads, is going to completely alter the structure and the composition of woodlands across large parts of the British Isles. Particularly here in the East Midlands, we have lots of forests which are dominated by ash. If you go to the Peak District, there are valleys filled with ash woods. Now, a lot of people are painting this as a disastrous thing, as it's going to destroy our woodlands. But I think a, a longer term perspective is, is needed here, which is that because trees live longer than us, we always think that if a tree dies, it's, it's a disaster, something's gone wrong in nature. And if large numbers of trees die, it's a catastrophe. The truth is, because we don't really know the population cycles of trees, this may be a perfectly natural occurrence. It may be that diseases like this periodically sweep through tree populations and then they die back and then they recover in time, as we know Elm has done repeatedly through the centuries. What this means in our terms, within our lifetimes, we may well lose the ash woodlands that we're familiar with. But ash will come back. And in the meantime, it will be an opportunity for other tree species. So ash often shares woodlands with oak trees and they will probably have a growth advantage for a few years after the ashes have gone. We may also find hazel tends to grow underneath it, so you'll get a lot more hazelnuts which will be good for the animals that forage on them. So although it's going to be a big change and a dramatic change, that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's not necessarily unnatural, it just means there's a cycle of turnover and the woods will end up looking different in the end. One of the problems is that because we've modified all the woodlands in the UK now, None of our woodlands are natural. There's nothing we can call natural in that there's nothing we haven't in some way modified or altered. What's natural essentially boils down to what happens in between human interventions. So in the period when we're not doing anything, that's natural. As things invade, as they spread, as they die, as they grow back, those are natural processes. So the wood itself is not natural, but the things going on within it and the dynamics are themselves natural. If humans never intervene and should, should meddle out of it and just let the trees do what the trees are going to do, what's the point of your research? 
the point of my research is understanding the natural dynamics and trying to work out what's really going on. It is important for humans to intervene at points. There are times when species need our help, when some kind of management is necessary to maintain particular communities or populations that are at threat. And that's the issue, is that sometimes these dynamics aren't themselves enough to keep the things that we would like to see in nature. And so we have to provide a helping hand every now and again. Some of this off. What's that? This is the resin of, of Scots pine. And it actually has some quite nice antibacterial properties. So you're supposed to be able to make an infusion out of it or chew it if you've got a throat infection. 